25 summers, we back. All right, let's talk more about uh, Dice, a.k.a. Little Kim, and, um, you know, brothers that's similar to him. You know, let's talk about their hearts and their principles of these men who make certain choices in the penitentiary to survive. Whether it's drugs, joining gangs, you know, religion or their sexuality, just things they do to survive and how that doesn't dictate who they are as men. Speak on that. Yeah, it's it, it's not. I don't know what goes through their brain to make them snap and make them realize that, man, that they, a different function is about to happen in their brain because these cats just wake up one morning, man, and they change a whole different identity. But one thing I did find out with them, right, that, you know, um, Looking for a way out, you know, once you all in, like all in meaning you in prison, you got a lot of time, you maybe got 25 to life, 15 to life, something looking down the line seems far-fetched to you. These where these drastic decisions come in, and this is where the mind plays the tricks on the individual that's locked up in a penitentiary, and then they start to become a different characteristic of inside of them in themselves. But it didn't do anything with the heart and the integrity of a man. Because I've seen a lot of individuals, Dice was one of them, like I said in one of my last segments, that um, he might have an identity crisis, whether or not being female or male. But one thing he didn't lose, he didn't lose the heart and the ability to wreak havoc on the dude's ass, man, if a dude violated him. And he was warned not to, not to violate this dude, heckle him or any type of way, because this is the same dude that was on Rikers Island, this legendary, you know. And with them predicate cutters and all of that, he was one of the first to start that, man. That's another segment about a bunch of dudes hollering about they predicate cutters and all of that. You're not a predicate cutter because you cut one dude. You're a predicate cutter because you're a serial predicate cutter. You're cutting people regularly, two or three times a day, or once a month, or two, twice a month in the yard, or out in the broad daylight open in front of the officers. Then you become a predicate. But, you know, a lot of these dudes is claiming they predicate cutters. But, yeah, Dice is one of the first original ones. That they put in handcuffs for assaulting somebody. So, um, where does the term predicate cutter come from? Is it Rikers Island or is it upstate? And what exactly makes you a predicate color cutter? And how do they treat you? As far as how okay. do they transport you around the prison and mm -hmm. things like that? Okay, we 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 all are prisoners and we all in Rikers Island setting, right? Okay, something jumps off, right? And now you know, <clears throat> normally the uh, five O police. They, they look forward to a one-on-one -on -one fight. But now they have these fights now where they're not one-on-one -on -one no more. And then when they break it, they see something real strange happen, a real strange move. And next thing you know, the inmate is bleeding profusely from the face, Lincoln, because he was striked with an object. This how the officer knows that this other inmate, it becomes the assailant. He just cut him. That's one time. They got you on record for doing that. Normally, you go get a new bed, an outside charge where you're going to get additional time or you go into a special housing unit by way of the Bing. The Bing is a place, a special housing unit for Rikers Island. Up north, it's called SHU. So you go to the Bing. When you get out the Bing, they maybe give them maybe four months, five months, in there to think about their punishment. Then they let them right back out into general population. Nine times out of ten, they repeat that. They'll do it again at a larger scale. Maybe this time they may cut two people. Then the administration deem that you're a problem. You become a predicate. Now, when you're dealing with the criminal justice system and you commit a crime in the street, your first offense, your second offense, you become a predicate. A predicate means someone who repeats the same crime over and over again and apprehended for it. In prison, adapted the same thing. You cut a guy, and then they give you your punishment, and then you come out again, you cut another guy, now you become a predicate cutter. But now this time it was a security thing where they put you in handcuffs, and everywhere you move to and go to in the facility transported, you're in handcuffs, ankle, ankle shackles, and waist chains to and from your movement and then you released out of your shackle chains and waist area until you're in an area where you can't afflict no harm or no pain or no danger to the officers or to the prisoners at large. Okay, here's the question. Why are the booty bandits and the sexual predators not removed from the blocks or the dorm if there's so much violence and so many tough guys in the prison? Why are they not removed why or why are they able to live okay the reason why they're able to live and if you can understand this very closely because i'm explaining it to you it's because it's called balance of metrics in the prison system they have to have a balance 
if everything was all good, there would be no need for a prison. So it's just like you got good and you got evil. <clears throat> it makes it a balance. Just like you got God and you got devil. It makes it a balance. So now the <clears throat> excuse me, the booty bandits are able to live because no one really wants to confront one of these guys about something unless they did it directly towards them or like me. They came directly to towards me with some of that nonsense with this homosexual thing. I'm dealing with them right then and there. But in most cases, these dudes get to live. They get to frequent the facility. They get to live around all of that until they go up against somebody. And when they go up against somebody who is somebody, which means has a name, person that gets busy, person that's not a punk, then they's exposed. Now they're a problem and they must go. And that's how they're able to live because there's ones walking around in disguise. You'll never know that they're a booty bandit until later on you'll find out they're booty bandits. But it's plenty of them that made their mind and reached that conscious decision when they came into penitentiary that they didn't care where they were or what they did or how they did it, that they was going to find some young man in there that was going to be attracted to them and they was going to utilize him as a female if they was in society. Okay, let's talk about cash in prison currency, U.S. Mm -hmm. currency. How does it get in? What is it used for? What's the most you ever seen? If the officers find it, where they keep it, it turning in? Mm -hmm. And do people use cash to bribe COs and staff? To all the above, yeah. Cash is the greatest commodity inside the penitentiary system. Once you have cash, cash is coming in by way of visits, <clears throat> just like the uh, marijuana's coming in. It's coming in just like that. They got other inmates that have slick ways of getting it in by way of mail, by way of knowing people through the visitation. Once you have it, it's almost like gold. It buys anything. It gets anything you want. It buys an abundance of anything you want. It makes, like E.F. Hutton says, when he talks, everybody listen. Well, cash, is. it talks, and it talks in large volumes in the penitentiary, and it's in there frequently. And the most, like me personally, I, I was leaving going to Attica in 2009, and I had a radio, which was called a Super 8 radio, and it was a receiver that the facility let us order by it for music, and I was being transferred to Attica, and so all your personal property is going through through what you call a, a, a strip area, a search area, where it's monitors, and it's going through scanners and so forth, and once it went through there, uh, they realized that something was being held and my radio that didn't look like it was wires or anything. So they took the radio and they put it to the side and they deemed it contraband. Once they opened up the radio, like I said in one of my earlier segments, they found 3,500 stamps and they like uh, $1,300 cash. That was my money, money that I've accumulated by selling goods and moving things around and moving cigarettes around. Like I say, those three things were the major factors. It's the cash, number one. Then it becomes the cigarettes, number two. Then the stamps, number three, are all commodities that can easily be used and considered as money. Well, does is there any cases of anybody trying to bribe the uh, COs and the staff for cash? No, it's not a lot of cases of bribing that because because it's uh, officers, or uh, that's not the type of breed of officers they are. That cash is usually mostly amongst us, the prisoners. That's what basically what cash is used for. Cash is used to move things around prisoners and get things from prisoners and stuff like that. When you get upstate, upstate New York, man, you're dealing with a lot of hick town officers, a lot of white hillbilly officers, a lot of cult officers, a lot of parts of uh, these these grand poobah thing officers. So they're not subjected to, you know, you take $10. $10 is nothing to them. These guys work, they make money and all of that. Something in our cash, like other prisons in other states, man, maybe these guys see tens and thousands of dollars. But in New York State prison system, you don't get to see that type of money in abundance like that. Very rarely, man. Like I say, I was apprehended going to Attica in 2009 with $1,500, $1,300 in cash and like 3500 stamps. And I was given an infraction for uh, promoting prison contraband. Um, did the New York prison system have boxing programs that any point and if so could you tell us anything about it yeah sergeant jackson man was a good guy man he started the boxing program at green haven correctional facility he was a sergeant who believed that a prisoner can can channel his anger and all of that and and 
avoid getting into a lot of other heavy penalty, violent, violent acts in prison if he learned how to channel his anger. And the boxing program was giving people discipline and a chance to release their anger and so on. So he started a program and it started to drift up to prison system. And from jail to jail, it was good. They used to have uh, guys come in in Elmira and fight the inmates who was ready under the weight class. And they was getting retired firefighters and they was getting correction officers and police officers who came in. It was in good shape. They considered themselves boxers and giving these guys a chance in the penitentiary, the, the prisoners, a chance to showcase their talent, you know, instead of squandering and letting it go to waste because they varied a lot. And it was deemed to be a successful program until they started the sparring thing with the prisoner on prisoner sparring, ready for getting ready for an outside fight with an ex-cop or ex-whoever and everything. And this is where the melee started. This is where it went wrong. They started letting inmate and inmate or prison on prisoner spar against each other. Now you're dealing with egos and you're dealing with the penitentiary system. So now that two guys are sparring and one gets the heavenly best of him, man, instead of saying, okay, this is part of sparring and this is teammate thing and we're both fighting for the same game, it turns into a, a beef situation with them. And so now they actually take off the gloves and a day or two later out in the yard, they out there stabbing each other up with a shank, with a knife or something like that because one got a better off blow with him sparring. That was a bad idea from the jump. Initially, when Sergeant Jackson started it, he didn't let inmates spar with each other. The only sparring an inmate did was with a heavy bag or speed bag or with one of the dummy bags. The dummy bag is a bag that looks like a mannequin person and it has sandbags in it and you punch at it, man, and it got numbers on it so you get your coordination up and everything. He never allowed prisoner on prisoner to spar for that same mere fact that a prisoner is not ready to shed his 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 ego and participate in a sport that's that that's that can only give discipline and being a man so a lot of inmates man wasn't ready to accept that fact and because of that man it, it, it spilled out into the yard and the yard so the officers and the superintendent and the administration canceled out the whole program